So uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to do a little bit of an introduction so that you kind of understand where I come from and what my perspective is on this whole thing. I am an engineer. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so, you know, a lot of the things that I will tell you are just very pragmatic experiences from a guy who likes to invent stuff, right? Um, I, uh, I started my career, I went into engineering school because I really wanted to invent things that changed people's lives um, in a positive way. Um, so I went into communications. Um, I worked for a company called Alcatel-Lucent, which makes uh, quite a bit of the infrastructure that you guys are probably running your mobile devices over um, at your houses. If you have internet access, we're probably involved in that in some way. Um, and I got really lucky because uh, I went into the communications industry 15, 20 years ago before the internet was really big and wow, has it changed the way people behave. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, just a few things, uh, you know, from our corporate stats, we know that some of the countries that we, we work in, there's more mobile phones than there are people. Um, so, and that's, that's quite a few countries, not just, not just one or two. Um, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, you, you think about, I was, I was reading on the plane uh, that there is, uh, they were talking about a um, small village in rural China near Tibet uh, where the people didn't have running water, but they had mobile phones. Um, people need to communicate, they need to socialize with each other. And then I think, you know, personally, um, my grandmother is from Australia, she moved um, to the United States, married my grandfather just, uh, you know, after World War II. Um, she tells a story about, you know, when she first moved to the States, she lived in a small community in the United States. Um, she didn't talk with her family for two years. Uh, and then the community got together and they, you know, bunched up their money and they gave her as a Christmas present to call home. And she got a one-minute phone call back to home. You know, and it, it, she talks about how difficult it was to set up. And then I think when I, when I was a kid, you know, she would, we would, at Christmas time, we would all sit around the table and there was a particular time when you'd call my great uncle and the family over there and you'd have a certain amount of time to talk to him and it was all really orchestrated. Um, all the way from now, my grandmother eats breakfast at my, at my great uncle's dinner time almost every day, and they have a video conference together, and so they sit together and they eat, right? So, I mean, talk about changing people's lives, right? Communications has really done that. Um, so I've been very interested in, in communications and, um, and in the whole innovation space. Now, when I think about uh, this particular topic of intellectual property, um, we heard a little bit about the way I think about it here um, from our, our first speaker. Um, I'd kind of divide it into, um, into two areas, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it a little bit further, um, which is kind of the, the edge of what I think is, is going on in intellectual property from my perspective. Um, intellectual property is, is certainly, you know, at its base level, the simplest way of thinking about it is it's protecting the things that I invent. Um, so uh, that's certainly a very good thing. It's a defensive thing to do. You know, if I make something, if I design something, I should be able to protect it and not have somebody copy it and make all the money off of it. Um, and then there's this other notion which we heard about, which is that um, as a company, as a corporate organization, I'm going to build a patent portfolio um, and that the larger my patent portfolio, uh, you know, the, the, more, the more weight I will have in a negotiation with another company that has a huge patent portfolio. So, um, this is sort of like the, the Samsung Apple thing that's been going on. It reminds me of, you know, giant fat sumo wrestlers who are bumping up against each other, trying to throw each other out of the ring. Um, and, you know, the, the more patents you have, the fatter you are, and the easier it is for you to knock the other guy out, right? Um, you know, both of those things, you know, it's funny, but it, both of those things are actually absolutely necessary. Um, but they do have this downside in that I think, um, you know, they, they have a tendency to somehow discourage innovation in a way. There's a, there's a dark side to them. Um, it, you know, the, the big players developing these big patents, if any small guy comes in, he may not even know 
that he's infringing on their patents, but as soon as he's successful, he'll get sued and go out of business, right? And so, um, you know, that's kind of the dark side of it. Um, absolutely necessary, but one of the things I've been really interested in is how do we make, how do we make um, intellectual property protection a positive thing? Something that encourages innovation. Something that, that you know, makes us more innovative, makes us able to more create value, um, and allows people to do the kinds of things that will change people's lives. And so, in order to do that, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on, um, on innovation and how innovation works. Um, the first slide here, I won't go into the whole thing. There's a very interesting book that, that these are the chapter headings of um, called Where Good Ideas Come From, A Natural History of Innovation. Uh, very entertaining. He goes into innovation in all sorts of fields of science and business and all sorts of things. Um, but he's done a really good job. It's from Stephen Johnson. Um, what I will highlight here as you're reading through them is innovation is about um, when the most innovation happens is when you get the most variety of viewpoints bouncing off each other and creating new things, right? So you want to create an environment where you, that is kind of open, right? Which isn't, it sounds sort of incompatible with in intellectual property protection. Um, at least that was my first thought. And what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to actually navigate that and say how can we increase innovation, not just through the protection, but because now I feel free to go be open with people because they can't steal everything that I'm thinking about, right? Um, so, you know, think about that. Um, one of the things about the communications industry that I think is really interesting is that we've almost been a, I don't want to call us a victim of our own success, but, but our successes ha had, have led to our difficulties, which means that um, as we've gotten better, at helping people to communicate, we've actually made it much easier for people to come into this industry and, um, you know, and, and change things, right? And so we've had to really, as we've, we've innovated, we've had to actually innovate faster because the tools that we're building actually help people innovate faster than we do. So um, a notion that came up to help solve this, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, and this is, a, again, from a book from a guy named Henry Chesborough that I've adapted. It's called Open Innovation. Um, you know, uh, this, uh, this is a model that was adopted by Bell Labs, which is, is one of the um, fundamental R&D organizations in my company. Um, you know them because they invented the transistor, the CCD device, I mean, tons of patents. Um, but, but about 10 or 15 years ago, they started saying, well, how do we do things faster? Because we've tended to be a group that, that did fundamental science invention, and it takes years and years and lots of money, and we need to do this faster and better. Um, and so they came up with this notion of open innovation. Um, and, and what that means is, is that at various parts of the R&D process, they're bringing in external, um, external ideas, external people. You can see here, um, things like external research projects, they can fund universities to do things for them. Um, they can make venture investments in smaller companies uh, and, and at, you know, at very early stages so that they get into this early stage funnel. And then moving on to the development process, you can do things like technology in licensing, um, you can do technology acquisitions, and you know, what we do is we slowly get down to a single product that goes after a current market and a solid business model. Uh, the problem is, how many people have read The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen? Okay, most people know this book, right? Um, the problem is, is that if you think about what I said about the communications industry, um, we have made it very easy for people to very cheaply reproduce what we do. So a good example of that would be something like Skype, right? So it took years and lots of money to develop the PSTN infrastructure. Skype comes along, you know, if you were to do Skype today, you could, you could rent a server out of the cloud from Amazon, you could spend, you know, a couple of weeks, and you could reinvent the PSTN um, and, and do fairly good voice services across the IP network. Um, Clayton Christensen actually said this is how large companies fail, is that smaller companies come in, they have a very low cost of production, 
and they do something not as good a quality as what you do maybe because you're looking after your big customers and increasing the quality, but they do it good enough and that gives them a toehold so that they can increase their quality and then lo and behold, all of a sudden they're a much cheaper way of doing business. And that's exactly what's happened to a certain extent with the PSTN and the voice network, right? Um, so what's, what's interesting here is that, um, is that, you know, and you see this a lot in the Valley, is what happens with these smaller startups is they have no customers. Right? So they don't need to do a business case. They don't need to do a business model. They sit in their garage for a couple of weeks. They come up with an idea. And their whole thing is to grow their customer base. Um, they almost don't care what the business model is. They figure, if I get enough customers, then eventually I'll figure out a business model to figure out how to make money with them. And so then they try a business model. And they say, can I make money with these customers by selling advertising to them, for example? Um, if that doesn't work, they do what they call pivot, which means I'm going to try a different business model and see if I can make more money you know, out of these, these customers that I have of my service. Um, I would argue that this is how real innovation happens, right? You look at something like I, I named Skype, which um, you know, we can regulate and, and those kind of things. It's the voice network. It's kind of a direct replacement. Um, what's more disruptive is something like Facebook, which completely changes the way we communicate with each other. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I actually have not called my wife in four days. And it's because we're communicating constantly via Facebook. I know exactly what she's doing. She knows exactly what I'm doing. She has pictures of it. You know, my whole family does. And it's because we're communicating via a completely different mechanism than voice. Um, so that's, you know, real innovation. Now, the question you might ask is, how does a company that requires a solid business case um, solid, you know, business models uh, and takes a, a large amount of infrastructure to build something, how does it compete against these guys that are going to come do this? It's a, it's a great question. And it's one that I started asking a few years ago. Um, and I came up with this notion of what I call orchestrated innovation. So it's, it's a flavor of open innovation, but the idea is that what we're doing is um, it's a directed collaboration of equals. So I've tried to engage an ecosystem of companies uh, that all have their own products that they spend years developing that they own intellectual property around. But is it possible for us to um, build innovation and build value for customers in the integration and the cracks between our products? Um, so that we can go out and try things very quickly because it's already a product that we have but what we're doing is we're putting things together in an orchestrated way between the companies. Um, and hopefully that makes sense. I'll answer questions if it doesn't. Um, the other thing that's key is that um, this kind of innovation isn't just innovation on um, technology. It certainly is a you know, building of a prototype of a kind of a service that you would produce a new end user experience with. Um, but with that new end user experience, you're pro producing a value for an end user. And so supposedly, you should be able to monetize that. So it's, it's as much about business model innovation and value creation as it is about the technology itself. Um, it's also about things like regulation. So we, we, we have a broader conversation than we would in just a product. Um, uh, you know, product innovation kind of thing. Um, and so the program is called NG Connect. I won't do too much of a plug here, but, but basically it brings together companies from a lot of different industries. Um, I am always interested in, you know, when you, when you get an automobile manufacturer together with a retailer, together with, uh, you know, a health company, together with a networking company like us, um, something really interesting is going to pop out of that interaction because they understand their businesses way better than I do. And so by us interacting, we can come up with things, you know, new end user experiences that can happen um, that I don't think any of us could come up with individually. Um, how does the program work? So just kind of getting, you know, practical here. You saw on the first slide where good ideas come from. Um, this is kind of a, and I won't go into the full detail here, um, this slide could take me 40 minutes. <laughs> but there are three key pieces. One is bringing together a large group of people, sort of developing the innovation ecosystem. That's companies like 
you guys have. It's people like Amcham. It's, you know, all these companies bringing them together with their own perspectives and understanding. You have to have a space for them to go together. Um, uh, you know, and I use space loosely. It doesn't have to be physical space, but you have to have a place where they can all meet and interact in an open way. Um, and then you have to kind of have a process, and that process has to be agile, where you can try things, you can make mistakes um, in very cheap ways um, and, and iterate on those mistakes, use those mistakes to learn from and produce something even better. Um, and out of that process comes three things. One is a prototype of an end user service, so an end user experience that's created that adds value to the end user. A business model, so a way that all the companies that are in the ecosystem are, are, could, could presumably make money from this particular service. And then the third thing is, of course, you've got a set of execution partners that, that you can go together with to create this thing. Um, this is actually a very inexpensive, cheap infrastructure that you can iterate on and start competing with the guys that are in their garage. Okay, so now we get, now you kind of understand, hopefully, what I mean by orchestrated innovation and being on the frontier of innovation. Um, how does it work and how does it fit in with property protection? So I won't go into reading all this to you, but basically the way I, I think our, the legal agreement that we've put together is actually a core differentiator for us and it makes the program work. As evidence of that, two years ago when I took over the program, we had 20 companies, we had a legal document that was size 50. It took us like nine, 10, 11 months to negotiate each one. It was just a hassle. Um, what the, one of the first things I did was I took that down, make it a click-through agreement, make it very easy to sign. And all of a sudden, you know, we now have over 200 companies in the ecosystem that are working together. So the legal aspects here and the protection of intellectual property is really, really important for creating these innovations. Um, the way it works is it's essentially an NDA um, that's multilateral between the companies. So um, the companies sign uh, onto the program with my company, Alcatel Lucent. And when they sign on, they agree to protect all the intellectual property for all the other members that are already in the program and that might join in the future. Um, it also anticipates some joint development. Um, so, uh, you know, th there is an anticipation of that, although if you were going to joint development with another one of the companies, we anticipate you sign a separate agreement that's a little more detailed. Okay. Um, there should be one more slide. Did we miss it? Oh, they didn't put the conclusion slide in. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, just in conclusion, there are a couple of things that I'd like for you to take out as far as, you know, somebody asked, um, you know, what would be the policy things that we could do to kind of help? You know, one is, I think, you know, digital disruption is happening. We need to encourage interaction and open interaction between companies. Um, a second thing uh, is that, um, you know, I, I think there's a frontier here, which is actually in going to market trials. And uh, my time's up, but I'd be glad to talk more about that if you guys want to, so, okay? <laughs>